I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about miscarriage and really what are some things that we regularly see that are missed from the conventional side of medicine and really how taking a natural or functional approach can really dig into some healing opportunities that may have been missed so that you can conceive with your next pregnancy and have a successful pregnancy. So excited for you to listen to today's episode. Excited that registration is now open for our free summer fertility challenge. The fertility challenge starts on Monday, July the 19th. Just go to fertilitydietfreebie.com. That's fertilitydietfreebie.com to register. In this live five-day challenge, you'll learn which foods are right for your fertility so that you can prepare for pregnancy success which foods could be harming your fertility so that you don't waste time consuming the wrong diet, simple steps you can implement right now so that you can optimize your preconception health and get pregnant naturally. I have worked with a chef who has a nutrition background to prepare these new summer recipes that will help prepare your body for a baby. This challenge is for you and your partner. Go to fertilitydietfreebie.com. That's fertilitydietfreebie.com to join. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have four spots available per month to work with us. I would like to invite you and your partner to a supercharge your fertility discovery call. And this calls for you if you meet at least one of these criteria. You've been trying to get pregnant for at least two years. You've been through at least one failed IUI or IVF. This calls for action takers. If you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. If you're seriously considering working with us, go to Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. That's Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. There's a lot of information about which supplements are right for fertility. And like most couples I speak with, you are probably taking a lot of supplements. But are these supplements optimizing or harming your fertility? That's why we recommend professional-grade supplements without harmful dyes, fillers, or top allergens so that you can prepare your body in the best way for pregnancy. And as you may know, we take a functional approach to fertility. And while supplements are included in your customized protocols, which are based on testing, they are only part of the equation because there's no pill you can take that will out supplement the basics such as poor diet, dysregulated sleep, either moving too much or not enough, and not dealing with chronic stress. So we do recommend basic supplements for both men and women. And these are essential starters that you need to have right now to optimize your preconception health. And I'm excited to offer you a special discount at our Fab Fertile store. You'll receive 15% discount on our professional grade supplements. So simply go to Fab Fertile Store, that's F-A-B, FertileStore.com to access the basic supplements so that you can prepare your body for pregnancy success without wasting time and money on supplements that may not be right for you. Go to Fab Fertile Store, that's FabFertileStore.com and save 15% on your order. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast. And I've got a favor to ask you if you are enjoying learning about the functional approach to fertility, consider going to iTunes and rating and reviewing the podcast. This is how it helps the show reach more people that are struggling with infertility, knowing that there's another approach that really can get to the bottom of why it's not working in the first place. So all you need to do is if you're on the app or the desktop, just go in and consider leaving a five-star rating and leave a review. And there is step-by-step instructions in the show notes showing you exactly how to do that. So if you can just take a few minutes, just take a few minutes right now, you can pause this, this recording, come back, leave the review. It would really mean the world to me and help others that are on the fertility journey as well. Take care. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously, mm-hmm. I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently, restored. I was still cycling back in my in my 20s. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under, Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle 
or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the, the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey there, I'm Sarah Clark, founder of Fab Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming Dr. Amatma Shah to the podcast, and we're digging into miscarriage and trying to conceive after loss. Dr. Amatma is a double board certified naturopathic doctor and endocrinologist. In practice for close to 15 years, she specializes in fertility and is the best selling author of Fertility Secrets What Your Doctor Didn't Tell You About Baby Making. Thanks so much for listening. I'm so glad that you're here. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Hey, Dr. Amatma, excited to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah. It's good to be here. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, can, first of all, can you share your journey and how you came to do this work? Yeah, totally. So for me, it was, I was already doing a lot of women's health in my practice. Uh, I was a natu- naturopathic doctor by training. So I was doing, you know, general women's health. It was about five years into my practice that I, I was going through my own personal questions around whether or not I wanted to have children, if the person that I was with was the person I wanted to have children with. And he was ready. We were married. He was ready to have kids. And I I just like, there was something in me that was just like, no. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was also very aware of what I had learned in medical school, which is our fertility drops off of cliff at 35. So that pretty much was all that I had retained. So I just massively started researching, what can I do for my fertility? And it, while I was researching, I kind of came, it like came upon so many studies around how natural medicine can support fertility, mm. how we, it, natural medicine can help preserve our fertility so that we can wait till later in life, and how little of it is actually truly based on age and more of it is based on what's actually happening within our bodies. So I started sharing about that and I've always been on different podcasts and things. People would ask me like, oh, what are you finding about fertility? And I would share what I was researching people started calling and they were like, Hey, how do you, can you help me with my fertility? And it took me a long time to say yes to the first person. And, <laughs> and the first person I said yes to, she was like, uh, I, I basically was like, listen, I've never helped anyone have a baby. I, this is, you know, like all of what I know about fertility is theory. It's not actual clinical knowledge. I really want you to like tune into your intuition and decide if I'm the right person to support you with your fertility and call me on Monday. If, and it was a Friday, call me on Monday if this is a good fit. And he called me Monday morning and she's like, you are the weirdest doctor I have ever met who has the like audacity to just be honest and tell me like, you've never had anyone get pregnant, but my intuition is really clear. Like you're going to help me. (laughs) And I was like, okay, great. Let's do this. She was my first patient. She got pregnant within three months. Hmm. She had had um, uh, three pregnancy losses prior to that. And I just saw like, I supported her through that first trimester really where she had had all of her losses. And we did a lot of mind body work. We did a lot of um, supportive things to help carry her through that pregnant, through that first trimester with like trying to restore the belief in her body that her body could get to a full term pregnancy and have a healthy baby. And that her pre previous experiences didn't necessarily have to determine what was going to happen with this 
pregnancy. And she actually went on to have a very healthy pregnancy and had a healthy baby. Since then, we have, I would say like pregnancy loss has become our subspecialty, partly because of my experience with her and just like, just falling in love with the couple and seeing what that journey was like and knowing that I had these like mind body tools that I feel are really crucial to helping support through that first trimester when so many women do miscarry. It just became like a passion of mine to do more to support this specific population within the fertility world. Yeah, I love that. It's sort of, as I say, a lot of this is interesting because it is guided by intuition as the practitioner and then as the patient slash um, client to really have like obviously fit, but then also listening to your body. Cause many times like, you know, I'm supporting couples and probably similar to, to you as well, where they may have been told, you know, you're going to struggle that it'll like, only be donor eggs or your only option, or, you know, it hasn't worked before. And so that kind of, you know, you may be told by a, by a, like a well-meaning physician that, you know, these are your only options and those kind of words and phrases get embedded in our subconscious. And then we are just you know, we feel like we lose, we've lost hope. And then that's what kind of breeds that whole impatience and panic and the biological clock and then has us do things that really don't serve us. And we just race. And that was me like racing like this maniac. And like my whole life actually been doing that and sort of to be able to, you know, to be able to look at the impatience and see where it's coming from and address those sort of things and then approach life in a more of a calm manner. Like you can still move ahead with a sense of urgency, but not in that panic lack kind of place. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's so vital that we learn to slow down and we learn to like take our intuition into account and really like be in a space where we can fully let our bodies do what they're designed to do. And it's so hard. I feel like it's hard when you've been on a fertility journey for three, five years, or you've had a few miscarriages, it becomes harder to trust that inner wisdom. Uh, And I think that that's probably you find this too, is like, that's where our approaches can really elevate people into reconnecting with that truth within us. Yeah, which is really empowering, right? We can, instead of searching outward, it's like going inward and knowing, like trusting our body and knowing, just knowing things will work out. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, as today's topic, we're going to be digging into um, miscarriage. So let her, let's, um, what are some steps to take if we've if we've had a miscarriage and um, once we're able to start start trying again, what to, to, to do after miscarriage? Well, I think the first thing, and, and I'll just go with this theme of slowing down, is the first thing is before we even think about trying again, we put a pin in it. And I say that because so many women like have a miscarriage and then the very next cycle start trying again. Mm -hmm. Our bodies go through so much, even in the first few weeks of a pregnancy, right? Like a lot of women are like, well, it was only like five weeks along or six weeks along. That's their belief. And they're like, hey, I just want to get back to trying and, and it'll happen again and it'll be fine. And that's the message that so many women get from even their fertility doctors, OBGYNs, whoever, um, the message is, it's fine. Just try again. It'll be okay next time. Our approach is slightly different. Once you have a miscarriage, which, you know, I feel like this is a hard topic to talk about because our goal when we are working with women is that they never have a miscarriage, right? Like Mm -hmm. we want to support them and have them ready to the point where we feel confident that their body can support a healthy pregnancy to term. But if it does happen, then our next step is to really like pause, reassess, realign in in the sense of like, let's make sure that our hormones actually go back to optimal place optimal state before we try again. And that again is to help reassure our bodies, but also like 
the hormones and the the signals that those hormones are giving out are going to impact the quality of the eggs. So if and when a miscarriage happens, it's really important to get those hormones back to alignment before trying again. If you aren't working with someone, then at least waiting two to three cycles before you try again is essential. But if you have the capacity to work with someone, then really working with them on, hey, it's great. Like, let's acknowledge that your body got pregnant. And that can be a celebration in and of itself. This just happened there. We were working with this woman who has been on the fertility journey for seven years, I Mm -hmm. believe. And she has never gotten pregnant. She's been through multiple IVF cycles, never conceived. And now she's 45. She started working with me last year. And I gave her the go, the green light to go ahead and start trying. They literally got pregnant on the first try, (laughs) which I wasn't anticipating at all. And then her, her body was doing really well with sustaining the progesterone and all of that. And then, um, she actually, I believe that what happened was she went for a trip or something like that. And she ended up having a miscarriage. (laughs) She miscarried at the six or seven week mark. And her instinct was, oh, I had a miscarriage, but amazing. Like I got pregnant for the first time ever, you know, like that alone, she's celebrating. And um, she's, she was ready to start trying again. And we did the same thing. Like, let's put a pin in it. Let's rebalance. Let's wait till your hormones are back to balance. And sure enough, her estrogens are still off the chart, which has always been an issue for her. And her FSH was high, which is not uncommon for a 45 year old. Mm -hmm. So we were like, okay, let's hit the reset button. Let's get your hormones back into alignment because with an FSH of 11 something, there's no chance that your body is producing really great quality eggs. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that those eggs are really good quality before you get pregnant again. I, I kind of like talked to her about it. She was like, okay, I'm on board. I trust you. Like we can do this. (laughs) Like in my gut, I'm like, I know she's going to be fine because yes, she's 45, but her, she has lots of eggs. So that's a good thing. She, her body's done it once, you know, like we got her to that optimal hormonal balance place. Um, So I know that we can do it again. And we know that stress is a big factor for her. So as long as we're impacting or supporting her body through stressors, she's going to be fine. For even for someone like that, who is in that stage of like feeling rushed and wanting to get to the finish line as quickly as possible because of age, (laughs) if nothing else. Um, Even for her, it is so important to get to that optimal place. So all that to say, really like before you start trying again, just making sure that your hormones are as optimal as possible because that's what's going to be the signal to have really good quality eggs. There is probably, I find this often is after a miscarriage, we're expected to and encouraged to just like push it to the side and move on. But in reality, like there was a spirit a baby spirit that we connected to energetically. And there is a loss there that is a felt experience. And we have to, hormones are good to heal. The other side is we have to heal the emotions. We have to process the grief in some way. Otherwise, that grief tends to lodge somewhere in the body. It could be the Chinese medicine approach is, hey, it's going to lodge somewhere in your lung meridian. What I find is with miscarriages, a lot of times it's lodged in our reproductive organs. Mm. And there is a link to the ability to get the grief out of the body through the large, the lung and the large intestine meridians. That's Chinese medicine terminology. But 
essentially the the ways to get it out are through the support of lung and large intestine. So we do a lot of work when someone has a miscarriage, whether it through th- like after working with us or even before working with us the losses and grief have to be, we got to make sure that they're released from the body so that when you get pregnant again, they're not re-triggering the same set of emotions, which then create, not always, but they can create a likelihood to have a similar experience again. And what modalities then are you using for, to help with for the, the losses to kind of be able to yeah. release that yeah, spiritually and emotionally? Yeah. Uh, so I'm trained in something called body intuitive, which mm-hmm. is a system that's based on acupuncture meridians, but sort of like the energetic aspect of it. So we use a lot of acupoints, but we don't stimulate them with needles. We stimulate them through tapping or essential oils or um, stones, even like crystals and things like that. Like we can stimulate or support the the energy of those points through so many different ways. Even a simple like massage to that acupoint can stimulate that point. So we don't use needles. And the really cool part is that because we don't need to put needles in, I can work with people anywhere and be able to guide them through like, here's the point, you're going to stimulate this for three days in a row, or you're going to stimulate this every other day for a week, whatever their body needs. It's really individualized and we have the capacity to individualize it for them. Nice. Because I think this, this piece where people are like, you know, with grief, it's not linear and, and being able to sort of will hit people and not knowing how to like, we're like, just, just get on with it. We want it. We want to, although, you know, obviously honoring that, that, that loss. And sometimes people don't even, aren't even able to honor it if they haven't even shared it with anyone and then being able, let alone being able to process it. And as you say, mm-hmm. getting pregnant again, could then the early weeks and months of pregnancy can be very, you know, anxiety inducing for people. So to be able to, to work through that ahead of time, that's like taking that. So it's pretty, are you saying like a minimum of, of, of two to three months ap- yeah. after a, a loss? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Anything else to do before they start trying again? Uh, what else? For me, it's always if they're coming to me having already experienced a loss, I also feel like there is a set of things that we want to check out for the guy to make sure that the sperm and the quality of the sperm is not also contributing to the fact that they're having a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And this, I, it's been probably six or seven years now. I had this couple that had experienced another couple that had three losses before they found me. I looked at the woman's hormones and I was like, yeah, there's some things we need to work on. And yes, those things are going to help support egg quality, but it's not enough. There has to be something else, right? I asked the guy and he was like, no, the doctor said my sperm are great. I'm like, okay, great. Send me the results. I look at it and I was like, no, the sperm are great. I was a little bit like, hmm, what do we do now? And I had started seeing a connection between uh, blood sugar levels in men mm-hmm. and how it links to not so much quality of sperm that can be detected in a semen analysis, it's not getting picked up in a semen analysis. But there's something going on with the quality of the sperm if this couple has had the miscarriage. And it's taken years in the research, like I've been tracking this for a while now. And it was only two years ago that I finally saw enough studies that were like, yeah, this is a link. And essentially, the link is when men have high blood glucose levels or blood sugar levels or insulin resistance, which is slightly different to diagnose. But when they have one of these things going on, they are producing somehow there is something going on at the DNA level of the sperm that is making the sperm poorer quality and um, leading to a higher rate of miscarriage in the in their partners, and that so that link is pretty fascinating for me. And since then, since like six years ago, when I first started picking up on it, I started to like test all of the guys, mm-hmm. and and what we found is 
almost like 90% of the guys of the partners that have had miscarriages, they come in, they're like, oh, our sperm are great. Yeah. I look at it. I'm like, yeah, actually the sperm look great, even from my more strict guidelines. Mm -hmm. But then we like test their blood sugar levels and sure enough, they have high blood glucose levels. Mm -hmm. And most, a lot, quite a lot of them are bordering on diabetes and have never been tested. It's never been detected. Um, they don't, obviously, they don't have any signs or symptoms. So they're just like going about thinking they're amazingly healthy when they're not. So we always want to test the guys. The other link in the research that also around the same time was uh, the, a link to hyperhomocysteinemia in men mm -hmm. that is leading to higher pregnancy losses in their partners. So just those two, there's, you know, there's other things that we like to test just to make sure the guys are healthy. But those two specifically have links to miscarriage rates. And that should definitely be something that we want to test in the guys. And if it's an issue, we want to address in a way that supports their bodies to produce healthier sperm. And sometimes that will take like three to four months to address, to test, address, and reset before we give them the green light. So those are things that we're always wanting to look out for and making sure that out, like because an embryo and the quality and health of that embryo is based on not only egg quality, but also sperm quality. We just want to make sure that we've done everything we can for the couple before they conceive again. Can you just talk a little bit more about the homocysteine anemia that you were talking yeah. about? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, hyperhomocysteinemia is generally considered to be homocysteine levels, or I believe it's 11.2 is the American standard. Um, I don't know the Canadian numbers. That level, when it when the homocysteine levels are above that, that's what research says. Mm -hmm. Our standards are a little bit different um, because I've been trained by Dr. Ben Lynch, who does a lot of like epigenetic work. His standard for homocysteine is, is if it's above 7.2. If the homocysteine level is higher than 7.2, we're going to want to do something about it. And essentially, homocysteine is a byproduct of methylation gone wrong. So if your body is not methylating, which is like, I never know how to explain epigenetics simply, but essentially there's all these different pathways in our body that need to operate in a certain way to make sure that we're absorbing and utilizing the nutrients um, from our food, from our supplements, etc. And a lot of that work is dependent on genes. If we have certain genes that are quote unquote mutations, mm -hmm. they're not really mutations. It's like variants right. of a gene. When we have certain gene variants, it leads to a likelier chance that those pathways are not functioning to their best ability. And when that's the case, the homocysteine is going to go up. And traditionally, homocysteine is like super inexpensive test that most doctors are happy to do for guys. Like it literally, I think out of pocket, when we ask people to pay for it out of pocket, if their insurance won't cover it, it's like $15. It's not expensive, but it's a, it's a very interesting marker to use to determine whether or not there is an issue with methylation and this gene profile or if it's not an issue. And we use it as a marker. So it's not diagnostic of anything. We're obviously we're using Dr. Ben Lynch's marker, which is homocysteine above 7.2. And when it's homocysteine above 7.2, we usually say, hey, there's probably something going on with your epigenetics. And we do this for men and women, not just men. We see that homocysteine is high. We're going to want to look at the genes and kind of do a, a protocol to rebalance or, or support the genes that are variants to make sure that all of those pathways are working the way that they should. And the byproduct of those pathways working the way they should is that the homocysteine level will go down. 
Um, so that's the the long <laughs> explanation of the homocysteine and how we're using it in fertility. Great. And definitely for the listeners to go check out, um, there's I interviewed Dr. Ben Lynch on the podcast, so you can check him out. And I have his book sitting right beside me here, um, Dirty Genes, which is a really good, good read, actually. It's a very, it can, it can be a complicated subject, but he just breaks it down in a very, like for the layman. And it's, um, it's really quite powerful book. I love it. You can check out that episode. I just wanted to go back about the green, the, the green light piece, because this is something where, um, like, as most people are like, when they start trying to have their child, they, they want the, they want to have their baby then they don't want to wait. And so being told that, oh, wait, you know, oh, wait, you need to wait to, to try. How, how do you approach that with people? We usually tell them that upfront in our preliminary consultation, like, mm. listen, you're going to be expected to put a pin in trying until you get the green light from us. And that green light might come at the three month mark, but Sometimes it takes five months. Sometimes it takes six months. It's really based on what it is that we see, what we need to, what we think is optimal. And you won't get that green light from us until you're optimal. And if you get pregnant outside of that, there are certain risks that you're taking. One is the risk of, let's say you get pregnant in our program. Um, one of the initial steps in the program is detox. Mm -hmm. So when we're detoxing the body, that there's evidence that those toxins could and are still like getting released or getting removed from the body for up to three months after a detox. Mm -hmm. So we want to, we do a detox because we want to ha help support healthier babies into the world. And the fact that babies on average are born with over 300 toxins floating in their bloodstream, that was a stat that I came across when I first started on this journey. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe we're doing this to our babies. Detox is a critical component. And I, and I feel like detox also supports our hormones to function better. It's, it's like lightening the load. So detox is essential, but if you get pregnant too soon after a detox, there's a possibility that those toxins are still floating around in your system and you're passing those on to your future baby. And we don't want that. So that's number one. Number two is if you get pregnant and we didn't know that you had started trying the likely chance that you are on some herbs that are contraindicated in pregnancy is really, really high. So we want to eliminate that as a factor. And then the third factor is the miscarriage aspect and like just not being in an optimal state and getting pregnant too early is almost always a struggle. Um, we just had this happen with this woman. Um, she's 39. They, they're so amazing. This couple has been just awesome. I've only been working with them for like three and a half months. They had a oops pregnancy, essentially. <laughs> so it, she flew out to us to get the hands on treatment. And while she was with us, like we're doing things that are essentially contraindicated in pregnancy mm -hmm. with the assumption that she's not pregnant because we asked her not to be. But she had gotten pregnant like two weeks prior to that, had a positive pregnancy test. Or she mentioned to our technician that does the hands-on um, that she hadn't gotten her period yet. And she, like my tech knows, she's like, uh-uh, hold up. You mm -hmm. need to go do a pregnancy test before we go any further. Sure enough, she's pregnant. We had to cancel her week in that we had her. <laughs> like she couldn't do any of the, the therapies. And only to like go fly home and her, like she, it didn't end up sticking. It was a bit unfortunate, but it, like she was on some things that are contraindicated in pregnancy. She was about to do a treatment that was contraindicated in pregnancy. And had she waited a couple more months, we would have had her in the optimal place and she was like, well, I'm really concerned that my progesterone levels were so low when we tested it. And I'm like, I'm not. We haven't worked on that piece yet. Like it's often people start feeling better and they're like, oh, yeah, we're just we're just having fun. And oops, we had we got pregnant. 
and didn't realize we were ovulating or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's fine. It happens on occasion. Like I'm not blaming her at all, but it's just like a good teaching moment to realize that if you are working with a practitioner, especially in our practice, we have a process and we know that 85% of the time when people complete the entire process, they're going to get pregnant within one or two cycles. So we really believe that the waiting actually gives people more time on the back end to, if for some reason it didn't happen right away, it's still not a freak out moment because we know that we've added time to their ovarian clock quote unquote, if we want to call it that. Um, So usually we just have those conversations up front. We're letting people know. And and then what I'm realizing is we need to just keep reminding them like, hey, if you're going to have sex, use a condom because we don't want to take those chances and we don't want to. The fact that this woman got pregnant so easily is uh, like a miracle in and of itself because her AMH is super low and her hormones were just about like almost perfect. And then we were going to start working on egg quality before we give her the green light. And (laughs) I think it's just amazing that once people realize like, oh, there's a process to this and I can relax and take a break from being on this intense roller coaster of like, I'm trying every month and it's not happening and it's not happening. It initially is hard to get to that point of like, okay, yeah, we're willing to take a break. It's kind of difficult to get people to that point. But once they get to that point and they are realizing all of the things that are happening in their body, all of the changes that are going on, they're really coming to the table with like, oh my God, it's actually a relief to not be trying so hard. It's nice to take a break and not feel like we have all this pressure. And then the other thing that I found is the the male side of this, which the guys come in and are like so stressed out that they're on a clock and like the, you know, woman's telling them when to have sex and ovulation is happening. Let's do this. And you need to perform and you need to ejaculate and your sperm better be good. And all of the pressure that these guys are walking around with, they almost always in solo conversations, they don't do it with their partners there, but in solo conversations, they're like, thank you so much for taking this off the table because, oh my God, it's so stressful. And like being able to take that break actually helps to restore intimacy. It helps to restore that like feeling of um, like sexual tension and sexual energy between the couple that then goes a long ways to when we say, hey, you're ready to start trying or you're ready to like take the condom off essentially. Mm -hmm they feel so much excitement around it rather than the dread of, oh my God, here's another month we have to try. You know, like the energy is just so different and they can come out with like, hell yeah, let's do this rather than, oh, here we go again. Um, and it's it's magic. Like the the weight and putting a pin in it is so magic that it's really hard to like, it's hard to not do it. And it's essential to do it. Yeah, I I agree. It's like the analogy of two steps back, but one giant leap forward. And it can be be hard when you're in the middle of it, you want to keep going, keep going. And then when you're saying you're like, wait, there's like a proven plan, there's a proven method to, 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 to follow here. And you follow it and you start making these changes and then it just impacts every aspect of your life because when we're on that, you know, that monthly journey and it's like pressure in every aspect of our life. And then how do we just, you know, release that and, and follow the process? So, um, which it's, it's still scary though. When you, when you, before you start that, it's kind of like, uh oh. And then, you know, I guess it is again to feel a feel that feels right for you. And sometimes people, you know, I do believe the the business of IVF kind of puts that whole panic that, you know, you're running out of time and it's doomsday, whereas that's just not the case. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's like so much of this panic is propagated by the fertility world. It's propagated by um, media. It's 
our own internal feeling of like, well, but I've been trying for so long. Am I going to have to try again for so long after I finish your process? And it's like, no, actually, you're not going to have to try for so long at all anymore. We can really like get you to a new state and quote unquote trying from that place is so different. Mm-hmm. Um, and it like, it's easy to, or I would say it's hard to see it in the future because you're so in the place you're in, right? Like you're so tied to this idea that you're on a clock and you're running out of time. And if you're able to pull out of that paradigm and say, Hey, maybe there's a new possibility for me. And that possibility is going to transform how how I try, it's going to transform my likelihood of getting pregnant, then we can kind of embrace that new possibility. But I feel like so many of us practitioners probably function similarly in that like we have to hold the vision Mm -hmm. for these couples until they can hold the vision themselves. Absolutely. And um, any common themes that you're seeing with miscarriage? I would say just what we've talked about, like a lot of the emotional energies being stuck in the body. That's definitely a really big theme. The kind of hormonal imbalances on the women's side that lead to potentially low quality eggs. And then the physiological impacts on the male side, the blood sugar and the homocysteine levels that lead to potential um, sperm issues leading to potential miscarriage. So those are the main things. I would say the last tip that I might add is to be very careful with travel. And I've seen this a lot And I don't know why it is like, maybe I need to go and see if there's any research papers on this. But I've seen that women who travel in that first trimester, and this is especially true for women over 40, but I think it can apply to anybody being in a place where you are traveling in that first trimester there's a likelier chance that it could land in a miscarriage. And it's unfortunate because I want people to be able to travel and I don't really want women to like schedule their lives around this. But I do find that there's something about being in the air on an mm-hmm. airplane yep. that is negative, a negative impact to pregnancy. Yeah massive emfs and all the the toxic air that we're inhaling i i I love the podcast um i follow uh luke story he has the lifestylist podcast and he is a complete like he's like when i get on a plane people think i am a complete i'm completely crazy he's like i have an emf blanket i have like my own water that i supercharge i have this whole entire thing because he is extremely sensitive to um emfs and literally just finds his whole body goes off it was just, it's just interesting because it's like, yeah, we're told everything's safe, right? But then, like, never ever drink the water on <laughs> that served you on a plane. <laughs> it's like got so much junk in it. So it's interesting to see that, like, anecdotally, right? Where, where you're seeing that. It's been a little bit of a query, you know, mm-hmm. like, I've seen it enough that I'm like, hmm, there's mm-hmm. something happening here. But there isn't, I haven't seen any studies on it. So I, I can't be like, Hey, you can never travel. Right. I, I just tell people like, Hey, if you're going to travel, maybe don't do a 15 hour flight for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. But if you need to get on a plane for an hour or two hours or whatever, it's probably going to be okay. I can't guarantee it's going to be okay, but probably it's fine. Mm-hmm. And so do you have any uh, books or um, apps or documentaries, anything you're personally obsessed with right now that you wanted to share? I am like when I talk about books, I'm more into like personal development stuff mm-hmm. than health related books. But there is there's a book that I just started listening to called The Queen, um, How to Be a Queen or something oh. like that. <laughs> I found it fascinating because... 
she talks a lot about how to be in our feminine, even while we are. Oh, oh here it is. I was trying to look up the name. The audacity to be a queen. Oh, sweet. Um, it's a lot about like how to live in our feminine energy without like feeling like we have to lose the part of ourselves that's passionate about our business or our work or whatever it is. You know, like there is there. There, I feel like there is a dance that we're doing. I often am trying to support women to embrace more of their feminine energy, but it's not necessarily meaning like, yeah, you just have to be a pushover or anything like that. I feel like the feminine is just so often misinterpreted. So I love listening and reading to books about that. And this, this is my latest one right now. <laughs> nice. nice. And do you have, uh, where can the, re- the, the listeners find you? Awesome. So I'm on Instagram, holistic underscore fertility underscore expert on Instagram. That is a really great place to connect, DM, comment, share, whatever, engage in whatever way you feel inspired. And then there is our website, which is the holisticfertilityinstitute.com. You are welcome to reach out through there too. And if I can just say that we are ha- we have a book that's coming out Ooh. from a collective called the Wise Woman Collective. Mm. Um, I'm super excited and jazzed about this book. So maybe I can share the link. It's sure. called infertility with like parentheses around the in mm-hmm. uh, secret struggles and successes i'm super excited about my chapter in the book but i'm also just excited about this collective and the fact that like women have shared these really powerful stories about their journeys through their fertility or quote unquote infertility mm-hmm. um and and then like other doctors and, and practitioners that are sharing about how they work with women and all of that. So I think it's a really beautiful book. And is there any, any final, any final thoughts on this topic? Probably a lot, but <laughs> no, it's, this has been great. I am glad to be able to like talk to you about things that I feel like we have a lot in common and we, we have similar approaches in how we work. So I'm glad to just have a, a sister who like relates and connects on this. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, thanks, Dr. Matma. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your words of wisdom on this topic. It was great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Excited that registration is now open for our free summer fertility challenge. Challenge starts on Monday, July 19th. Just go to fertilitydietfreebie.com. That's fertilitydietfreebie.com to register. Excited for you to sample the new summer recipes along with having access to our team of fertility experts during this live free challenge. Again, go to fertilitydietfreebie.com to register your spot. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have four spots available per month to work with us. I would like to invite you and your partner to a supercharge your fertility discovery call. And this calls for you if you meet at least one of these criteria. You've been trying to get pregnant for at least two years. You've been through at least one failed IUI or IVF. This calls for action takers. If you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. If you're seriously considering working with us, Go to Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. That's Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. You may be taking supplements that instead of optimizing your fertility, may be harming it. That's why we recommend professional grade supplements without harmful dyes, fillers, or top allergens. Simply go to Fab Fertile Store, that's F-A-B Fertile Store, Dot com to receive a 15% discount on our basic supplement recommendations for preconception health. That's fabfertilestore.com. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. 
please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.